What do you think persuaded Tommy Robinson to leave the English Defence League? I hope it was a combination of factors. I think, firstly, spending 18 months with me is probably more than enough to uh, <laughs> force most people out of most of their occupations. Um, I think spending some time with uh, a diverse range of Muslims, hearing different views. I think going to a mosque was really important. You could have, you could have knocked Tommy over with a feather at the end of that well, journey. Well, it was interesting. I mean, I watched most of the, the documentary last night. And, uh, you know, when you were making it, did you change your views of Tommy Robinson and the EDL? I think Tommy's been quite clear that he hasn't shifted um, in his views since before or during making the film. I think two minutes no, And what the... about your views of Tommy well, Robinson? Well, my, yeah, I mean, I did have an impression of Tommy. I thought he was... Uh, I had painted him as some kind of Goebbels-esque figure for, you know, the, the 21st century, and there but are elements wasn't of that... like that? No, no, I think, you know... It, Spending time with somebody always humanises them, and actually I think I found Tommy... There are soft sides to Tommy, although I think his rhetoric has been disturbing and I think the impact he's had on Muslim communities across the country has been disturbing. And, it's, and so I think, you know, there are... Like, like many people, Tommy's a complex character. I mean, the interesting thing about the documentary is that your views were also challenged mm -hmm. um, in the film by other Muslims Very who much don't so. necessarily yep. think you're a good spokesman for moderate Islam. Do you accept that? Well, I accept that they think that, yeah, absolutely. But you think they're wrong? Well, I've spent the last two days on Twitter batting back people who share ideologies with al-Shabaab, the far right, and Muslims who think that my views are, are not particularly Islamic. I mean, I stand for things like equality. I've been working as a head of diversity for an organisation. And, and you do things like equal rights and, uh, and, and stand up for, for women's rights and gay rights as well. Well, and let's sort of take some of those issues. Um, because on Sharia law, you were challenged by the head of the counter-extremism think tank, Quilliam, Majid Nawaz, on whether you approved of thieves being punished by having their hands chopped off. And you refused to give a definitive answer. Can no, you I give us I now? I do. I, th I think it's uh, absolutely abhorrent. Fine. Right. Well, that clears that one up. On the subject of slavery <laughs> in do you Islam... Know, actually, we did have that conversation. It just wasn't, didn't make it to the final cut. Right. So. Well, that's interesting. Well, that has cleared that up. On the subject of slavery in Islam, yeah. you've said in a Twitter exchange with historian Tom Holland, if slaves are treated justly with full rights and no oppression whatsoever, why would anyone object? And you were challenged on this again last night. Yeah, and today as well. Yeah, I, I, Twitter's one of those open forums where people can challenge. Right, so you stand by that claim that if, if slaves are treated justly, and with full rights, there's nothing wrong with Not it. Not in isolation. I mean, if you take that, if you take that comment in isolation, I would, I would push myself away from that, and I'll tell you why. Tom and I had a, had a three-day debate about slavery a year ago, and it was about the historical context in ancient times. And I think that was, a, I hope, quite an academic debate about those things. So this is... Uh, but, but are you saying that there are some instances where slavery is OK? No, absolutely not. I completely, I find it abhorrent, and I think um, there should be no slavery, but I think that's kind of an obvious question, I hope. Right, well, except you seem to indicate that, that there might be circumstances when in the right no, context... I think if you're talking about history fine. and you, you want to analyse something that happened a thousand 1,500, 2,000 years ago, I think you can, you can, there should be academic freedoms to debate these things. You mentioned um, women, women's rights and gay rights. Um, Tom Holland was in that documentary um, last night. He said that Islam and specifically certain historical passages in the Quran need to be reformed to take into account its setting in modern Britain with its more liberal attitudes, particularly towards women and gay people. Do you agree with him? To a certain extent. I think... Um, if we're talking about reformation, I think the reformation required is with Muslims, not necessarily Islam. I think there are behaviours, there are habits, there are practices which... But Muslims um, are practising the religion of Islam. If you don't change or try and modernise that religious setting, then how are you I, going to have more liberal I, attitudes? I, I hope you're not telling me that, we, uh, that Christians are the best example and the judge of Christianity. I'm not. I'm merely asking about so. Islam. What do you say in response to that, about this call by Tom Holland to, if you like, modernise or liberalise parts of Islam to take into account the setting here in Britain? Well, um, what I say, I mean, I, th I think he's talking about uh, should we have a reformation in Islam as uh, we had in Christianity um, some centuries ago. Um, there is a great debate going on uh, in uh, Islam about how you relate what's in the Quran and then in the commentaries, which the Hadith, uh, to modern day setting. And uh, the, the idea that there is one single school of thought in Islam is as fact, nonsensical as that, that there is uh, one single school of thought in Christianity. What I, and, but one of the things that's come out from what Mo says, although this is me, my language, is that a lot of the practices in Islam, which some, peop some Muslims believe relate right back to the Quran are in fact cultural. If you take the whole issue of the veil, 
or the position of women. Those are cultural or subsequent commentaries uh, on Islam, not in the Holy Do Quran. Do you still ask women visiting your surgery to remove the veil? Uh, I don't, well, they know that's my view. I certainly tell them uh, that I would prefer it, uh, and many of them do. I also say to them, I respect, I, I, I will honour their right to wear the veil, but it makes life a lot easier if I can see their face. I think Jack and I would agree and probably disagree on many things, but I've been very outspoken about uh, Peter Hollibone and Sarah Wollaston, and it was reported widely, uh, you know, about their views, which are very much stronger than your views, and they would effectively like to see my understanding as some kind of, you know, legislation put in place to stop those what things. What about young girls wearing the veil? I mean, Salma Yacoub, who was interviewed also in that documentary, former leader of the Respect Party, says she feels uncomfortable with young Muslim girls of six and seven mm. wearing the veil. Is she I, right? Do you know what? I understand that. I, I had a a long conversation with my Can wife about this. No, no, not necessarily. I'm saying I had a long conversation with my wife after the, uh, the film yesterday. She's from Finland and, and, and has a very uh, a European view, as, as do I, I think. And my view was, well, actually, each to their own. If parents and kids want to decide to do that, it's not necessarily my cup of tea, but they can do that. My wife felt actually the, that the headscarf is probably something which is about identity and mat a maturer thing. So the headscarf, fine. But we're talk but I mean, yeah. talking about the veil in front yeah, of the face. I'm, no, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. But c do we legislate for these things? We don't I'm legislate really for sure. it, Mo, but I think we should yeah. certainly say, as, as a norm, that it's not a good idea, because it isn't. Can I just ask about um, the conversation with the uh, former MP, Anne Cry, who said the Muslim community could have done much more to tackle grooming of white girls for sex. I mean, she tried to get leaders in her local mosque to talk to suspects' families, but failed. That's not right, is it? No, it's not right. It's not right. I mean, one of the discussions we had, and I spent three hours talking to the mothers and the families of uh, victims of grooming and with members of the English Defence League in, in, um, in Darwin, in, uh, near Blackburn, actually. And the part of that conversation was, look, we have a problem in society generally, not just here, but uh, across the world. In the UK, we have something like 200 women who are abused and raped every day and 50 children. Sure. Now, they come from but, all races yes. and but all no, cultures don't, and don't, don't dodge the issue yes. with great respect. It's not a dodge. It's not a dodge. Because there is a... Look, there are more whites, Gora locked up in prisons for sex offenders than there are uh, Muslims. But there is a specific problem in the Muslim community, which, which is to do with the way the Muslim f uh, families uh, tr uh, treat the women and the, and the young men come forward with a view about women, and that can tend to lead to what we've seen with grooming, where groups, uh, and it is predominantly Pakistani uh, heritage men, are grooming young white girls. But Jack, but I think the community hasn't done months, enough, just seen, finally. Well, I, I think we've seen over the last 12 months particularly, Muslim communities, organisations, individuals, be very outspoken no, no, about that's, standing and up that, against and, and there's been a so big they change. haven't done enough up until now. A bit. There, uh, I, I think there are complacencies around all sides, and the Muslim community needs to take their fair share of that. Ansar, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe.